Do you get in the zone when you work in the studio for long periods of time? I do. I'm trying to function from that place, you know? Mm -hmm. Ideally, I want that continuity to kind of be kind of an undercurrent to the image and the end. Because yeah. you're kind of seaming different things together and when in between painting sessions, you're having different life experiences and so forth. And, you know, you might approach it emotionally different, which I, I try to leave some of that out of it. I don't know. I, I don't know how to, uh, I try to manage, you know, my emotion in a way that is, is uh, subordinate to the continuity of, of the painting, but still allows it to come in, obviously. Okay. I want to hear more about that. Managing emotion subordinate yeah. to the continuity of the painting. Does that have to do with patience? Does that have to do with uh, with the, your emotions change from beginning to end of the process? Yeah, I think, well, patience is huge for me. I had to learn it and I had to hone it and I had to foster it because I'm not inherently a patient person, I would argue. But as far as the emotional part of it, it, it there's times I just maybe don't want to paint or there's times I, I'm really mad or, or something, you know, or or sad or whatever. And I might, you know, but that's, that's no reason to not work, you know. So, taking that with you but not letting that, you know, destroy the painting, you know, come in and kind of and take over the painting. So, that's subordinate to the, the, the continuity and I think that that just comes with, you know, maturity. Some people have it really early and, and others don't. Uh, but, you know, it's just something that I would, I would keep in mind because a painting can change on a dime. You can think you've got it trapped in the corner all the way up to the finish line and then right there fall, you know, and, and then like one stroke later, the whole read of it, the whole read is is different. The, the, the thing you carefully nurtured all the way up into that point is is just vanishes. It, it, it's a feeling. Now, the painting, the image is probably still relatively okay or there or whatever, but you know, you want to leave on that note of like, oh, I, I really nurtured this to that point and then step back from it and that's the way I feel about how that painting was made and the, the resolve and I can accept that. I like that. I like accepting a painting in that, in that way um, it, it, instead of going, oh, damn it, I missed it. No, okay, well, I, I can just fix it and then fix it and then go, okay, great. It's great now, you know. It, if we're talking about mastery, you know, like, uh, which is something to um, uh, pursue, you know, and, and, and maybe never achieve, you know. It seems like an important part of the, the process if we're talking about real mastery, like the, the entire thing of it and, and, and the performance of it, you know, and the way you feel about the performance. It doesn't mean it's perfect. Because, but it means that the, the audience leaves with this, with this perfect. Is it a gestalt? That term, I, I, I keep hearing this term and this is an art term. I, I, I'm supposed to know this term, but you're probably gestalt right. Gestalt is a German word and here's what I understand is that the, the immediate sense impression, the thing that doesn't take time to analyze or think about, it's just that that quickly you get a vibe off of something. And uh, that's what you're talking about. The, the viewer has that impression. Yes. And, and also, as the creator going through the process, it has that kind of fulfillment that came along with it in terms of like, you know, feeling good about the execution. I felt pretty good about that performance. You know, I blew it here, I blew it there. But ultimately, like, I, I, that was probably the best time I, I, I recited that, that, that work, you know. And, uh, and I, I, I stand by that work, you know. And I think that along with the, the gestalt that you're talking about mm -hmm. of the viewer, those in combination, I think is, is maybe the recipe for a masterful work of art. I, I don't know. I, I've never made a masterful work of art yet. Wow. But these are the things I, 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 I think about and want to pursue. I, it's just fascinating how, what makes something, you know, resonate with a lot of people. Let me tell you what's fascinating to me. This is a trip to hear that you describe yourself as not a patient person. And the reason it's a trip is that I would, I, when I look at your work, I can see emotional involvement in the process, uh. long-term emotional involvement in the process. And anybody, a, a kid could figure out quickly, this is someone who spent a lot of time on this and cared. 
And if you're doing that painting after painting after painting, it's a relatively confident conclusion to say that's a patient person, but you're coming you're coming at it from having not been a patient person and it would did did the process of painting contribute to your developing patience? Yes. Yeah, so I said I wasn't inherently a patient person. I okay. had to learn how to be patient. And and then you're absolutely right. And one of the things I talk about a lot is is investment in a painting. You can't fake investment. It hits it it has a weightiness to it. And so, like, a la prima painting is how I cut my teeth. That's how I learn how to paint. That's, that's, you got to get those repetitions. It will always be a part of my, my life. Uh, is, and that is the way to learn how to paint, in my opinion, miles. But, you know, when you're talking about, you know, you know more ambitious works and so forth, there, the, the degree of investment and, uh, and, and time and patina that a painting can take on, I think, add, can, can add, to uh, to that impact that you were talking about, you, where anyone can recognize it. Wow, like there there is some time in this, you know. And uh, I, I do I do to some degree push for that. And, um, and I'm you know I'm a relatively lazy painter sometimes too. So, but this is all stuff over over time. I've I've learned to kind of kind of say, wait a minute, you know slow down and give this enough respect right here in this particular area or so forth. You can be a little bit quicker and kind of cut a corner here and actually balance it out and, and create a nice balance of really high resolve and then kind of an impressionistic area that will complement each other. So, I try to like wage that war carefully um, mm -hmm. to, to, to make sense visually. Gold coin number two. Thank you. Now, you mentioned a couple of terms that people who are not trained yet, not experienced painters may not understand a la prima or patina. Can you explain what, and, and you, you spoke so highly of a la prima as a way to learn to paint. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, a la prima is basically just painting in one session and finishing it. Um, you know, like Richard Schmidt's book was just an amazing book for painting for me. It, it really taught me everything I, I kind of needed to know uh, to, to, get my, to, get my, to get in the water and start becoming a painter. Uh, in, in terms of color edges, the visual world, and uh, just materials and other things, but all the prima painting is is basically direct painting, you know, and painting from life. Uh, there's no middleman. There's no interpretation for you. It's you making the choices. And sometimes you might want a certain look, but when you find yourself working under certain time constraints, you have to edit and you have to you have to distill the information and go for the essentials to create that, that image or that visual that experience. And so, you, you learn a lot about uh, yourself through, through all the Prima painting, uh, even in terms of like what you want to set up and paint. You know, you do 25 paintings, you start to see a thread of continuity there. Uh, but as far as, um, um, as far as learning goes, just getting those repetitions with the mixtures, that, that, that familiarity with the process, the setting up, the the design, the block in, and the phases of the painting that kind of need to happen so that you can be effective and and uh, economic with your time. Uh, you just learn a tremendous amount through failure. Obviously, I mean, uh, lots and lots of bad paintings, and then one good painting comes along, and you go, "Oh my gosh!" Like I've been doing that that all wrong, I, I, and now I can try to use that that n new knowledge to be more efficient in the future, and then it just kind of goes on from there. That's that's great to hear. Uh, it's the doing it in one sit, uh, sitting. It's not a lot of preparatory work. Doing lots of them, and also seeing that there is a a bias that you have towards subject matter uh, and toward approach. So you're doing self therapy in a way with a lot of alla prima. What is patina? Patina is just build up over time. So in an indirect approach, you know. A painting can have uh, multiple passes, and as soon as you, as soon as that paint dries and you work back into that portrait, something inherently changes about the nature of that portrait. It's no longer a, a direct painting or an alla prima painting, and and that can be that can be that can work against you if you if you carefully work back in there and try to make it look like a you know you just want to do a few changes here, it might weaken 
the freshness of the alla prima and not really take it anywhere new or improved. But if the underpainting is just what it is, is an underpainting, and then you build up layers to get somewhere further, now we're talking about patina where there's a lot more uh, maybe complexity and the, the textural buildup, uh, nuance in the surface rendering of the subtlety of form, uh, nuance in, um, in, in color and just paint quality and application, uh, and, and patina meaning just that, that investment of time that, like you said, is undeniable. And, and a second, third, fourth, fifth stage of painting requires the painter to be all in. I mean, you can't just go in there and say, uh, I'm going to hesitantly hit this and try to make it look like I did anything. You've got an objective in those, those later stages. Certainly. Uh, yeah. And I think the painter has to be all in at every stage and, and be able to change gears at every stage. You know, being all in and the block in and say, hey, I just got to shovel dirt right now, you know, and, and be excited about that. Love that work, you know, just getting, just getting stuff on there. And you got to be dedicated to that and you got to be ready for, for something special to happen even in that shoveling dirt mode of, of painting something, right? Because that, that's where your, I think your um, disposition is really important at every stage of the painting. And so, shoveling dirt is, is, is good work, you know? And so, be ready for something special to happen or to find something great in that painting because that could carry the painting in a really great direction in those later stages. But every subsequent stage or, or layer or painting session, yeah, I mean, being, being uh, all in is, is really important and, um, and, and should serve a purpose, you know. There should be clarity in, in some, I'm, I'm trying to go that way and there's a destination there. It's not always the same purpose, right? Certainly not. I think, yeah, I think that's a great point. Uh, it, it can change. It can be for a higher degree of resolve or polish or finish or nuance or it could just be textural you know trying to get that that texture built up and and working within the entire composition as a whole so it, it could be a lot of different things yeah joseph this is great this is wonderful stuff uh and i'm tempted to pursue it and find out more but this is also the kind of thing joseph teaches online so you have access to him as a teacher and what happens in those later stages after the lay-in is stuff that can be elaborated on in a class. <laughs>